now I'd like to invite the audience to, to ask uh, our speakers any questions that you have. Harry? Yeah, uh, good, good question. The, the primary uh, treatment that we use is deep brain stimulation, uh, electrical stimulation, and the, the answer is no. We really have the best results for the, the <clears throat> dopamine response and motor symptoms and the non-motor, uh, which becomes the most disabling part of the, of the, of the disease, uh, is relatively resistant to treatment would so that, far. Would that include hallucinations? I was just thinking about what Yeah, I mean, a lot of the treatments exacerbate those problems. Right. Um, and, and I think it highlights a, a point that everything that we do uh, really surgically and medically is, is symptom palliation. And, you know, the, the real need in this, with, with this particular problem and what Aaron talked about is neuroprotection or, or cure. Right here. Uh, my question is for Dr. Hansen. Uh, you said that progesterone is reversible. Is this uh, well, uh, you have to distinguish between acute and chronic. The chronic is not reversible, but in the acute phase, like the baby from Ethiopia that I showed in one of my first slides, we have uh, published a number of cases from Europe uh, where we have had children who came in with the classical neurological symptoms of connectors, some of them with positive MRIs also, and who have survived without neurological sequela, <clears throat> thanks to what we bilirubinologists tend to call the crash cart approach, which essentially means flipping on intensive phototherapy the moment you get the baby through the door. And one of the big challenges there is removing the obstacles for emergency care. And one of the reasons why we have been successful in Norway largely more than some other countries in avoiding this tragedy <clears throat> is that we have uh, organized our uh, baby care such that any newborn baby for whom the parents have a question they can call directly back to the NICU or the birthing unit where the baby, from which the baby was discharged, and the baby will re, be received immediately without any obstacles and taken care of. Whereas, for instance, in this country, the obstacles that have been identified by my colleagues here is the ER organization, for instance, that babies are kept waiting because of other more pressing matters, and it takes quite a while before they are admitted to a NICU. And the fallback treatment <clears throat> uh, relative to phototherapy is exchange transfusion. While you are very fortunate if you have blood ready to go for an exchange transfusion in less than two hours, and very often it takes longer, whereas phototherapy, as you can see, within two hours, you have 25% of circulating bilirubin being water soluble, so we are guessing, but have not been able to prove as yet, that that rapid approach has saved some of the babies who clinically had acute connectors. We have a question here from Tor. Well, the question of low-grade or intermediate effects uh, relative to jaundice is hotly debated. 
There, are, there is a Dutch study from 15, 20 years ago that looked uh, on uh, patterns of movement in, in, uh, in infants and seemed to find effects. Uh, but no one has, to the best of my knowledge, reproduced those findings. If they have, they have certainly not published them. So it, it's still uh, being very hotly debated. In fact, I just had an email earlier today relative to a, uh, uh, a review that uh, two colleagues of mine and I are writing and where the reviewer wanted uh, remarks specifically on that. And uh, Professor Maisols, uh, who is in this country, objected very hotly to us, this, even including that in the discussion. So yes, there may be something like what you're referring to, uh, but there is no agreement as to whether this is a fact. Mike? <coughs> C9 ORF 72. They just call it C9. Where you get FPV or ALS. And so I know you said we don't understand why, but number one, uh, can you look back in families in terms of that phenotype and that outcome or somebody doing that and looking for other variables from an epigenetic perspective? Number two, is there an animal model where you can actually go in and try to perturb and look at the signaling type of thing? So those are both great questions. So C9 is actually a very interesting disease. So what I didn't tell you all is that it's actually a nucleotide repeat disorder. And so the mutation that causes either ALS or FTD in those carrier patients is a hexanucleotide repeat expansion in that gene in a non-coding region. And so part of the complexity of understanding it is that we have very difficult time measuring repeat length in patients. And so we know even in a single patient, if we draw their blood and measure their repeat length, they may have 1,000 repeats. But in their frontal lobe, they may have 400. And in their spinal cord motor neurons, there's also somatic mosaicism, but they might only have 150. So there may be some component of the contractility of the, new, of the repeat expansion itself, both within a patient and within a family in terms of whether that leads to one of the two diseases, so the location of the expansion, they tend to get larger, not smaller. Um, and there is a mouse model. So it, it took a lot of time to make one. Laura Ranham's group just published a mouse model not long ago. The problem is it's 20% penetrant. And um, those of you who work with mice understand how difficult it is to work with an animal model with that low penetrance. So we're getting there. Um, we, uh, we, don't, we don't understand at all. We, we are following patients in families that are currently asymptomatic prospectively to look at, at their development of disease, but we're not there yet. The mutation was discovered in 2011. There's a question in the back. Sure, so that's a, a, that's a really interesting point. So CTE, or chronic traumatic encephalopathy, is primarily a tau disease. And um, FTD is a, is a misnomer, quite frankly. So FTD really encompasses a whole host of disorders, probably including the Parkinson's plus syndromes like corticobasal syndrome, progressive supranuclear palsy. And so I would put CTE in that category under the umbrella of an FTD. So um, George's work on tau, other people's work on tau, I think it's really critical to understand the prion propagation, like the prion-like uh, propagation properties of the tau disease. The particular disease I study, C9, is actually a TDP43 disease. So I don't touch as much on tau. Um, George may have more, more thoughts on that. Thank you. Right here. Clinical research, do that. What's category? 
research. And the IRB, you know, IRB is very powerful. Asking it to contact the US FDA to prove that. And this kind of clinical research is for go to the you know clinical trial. There is a waiver site for clinical trial for the government, something like that. I don't know how we handle that. Okay, that that's big stuff there you're talking. <laughs> no, that's a complicated question. So of course ketamine in, in psychiatry is has under gone a huge uh, revival in the last few years and you're, you're doing research on that there with ECT patients and treatment resistant depression so I know that and uh, multiple companies are looking at different ketamine like compounds to um, uh, get on the bandwagon for those because there's uh, lots of data. You're right, insurance is a whole other issue and difficult. We still have that problem with using antipsychotic medications, using stimulants, using uh, modafinil for you know sleepiness. I still haven't gotten people to be able to uh, approve that unless you have a diagnosis of obstructive sleep apnea. I have trouble of insurance um, um, approving for um, L, uh, L methylfolate for uh, augmentation of antidepressants and, and other aspects. So that's, that's difficult. I always try to teach that cost of a medication that's on the market should not keep you from utilizing it for patients. Doesn't mean it's always easy. There's uh, you know, patient assistance programs and all that. But I think your bigger question on ketamine, I think there's plenty of places that do give ketamine. I think New York, there's a lot of them. And it, it's being given out and utilized, and I'm not sure there are really good guidelines of how to utilize it yet, so people are doing it in different ways. Your broader question of using things off-label, as I try to teach the residents too, is you what, what is the first, uh, first line treatment or approval, or what does the, the studies and, and those kind of things say, and if you have to go down to the next one or you have reasons not to use that line of treatment, it's justification. And that's your, your thought, your, your decision making of how that uh, will go is up to you. But even FDA approval doesn't guarantee it, right? So uh, TMS, right, approved for treatment resistant depression, VNS, uh, all of those. It's very difficult still until it's more widely used, and and then it, I don't know. It it seems like it's 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 easier to have it approved for a neurosurgical or neurological condition, which they all overlap, but not so much for psych. But I don't know what you guys think about that. So, I have many of the same problems, same problems. in my clinic. Okay, so. good. <laughs> it's not just me. A question in the back. Right, so it's, it's started already, but I would assume it's very common in neurology also for Ill, uh, illnesses that may not have as much um, depth, I don't know what the word is, depth or power behind it to uh, increase or have attention paid to that illness for funding or other sources. So families and uh, advocacy groups like the National Alliance of the Mentally Ill, or other groups that have very rare diseases uh, really push for that kind of thing. And they go for all the way up through legislation. So uh, the Association of Clinical Research Professionals, which I belong to and showed up there, one of the recent uh, annual meetings had, had a patient and their family come with a very rare genetic illness. There's, I think, 25 or something like that in the United States people and they all reach out through social media and gathered but together they were able to you know focus on getting somebody to listen about where should you focus what company might be able to help going through uh, legislative branches those kind of things but I think that's the power that it comes in I gather with social media people are much more a are much um, more able it's not a good phrase to band together to um, encourage research on things that we normally wouldn't, really wouldn't always look at. So, um, what do you think? Uh, I just wanna also encourage people to think outside the box for social media. So uh, we recently wanted to look at a genetic defect by, from which the largest reported case series was 11 
children. And we found two Facebook groups and were able to recruit directly from those Facebook groups into a study and ended up with 39 um, new patients. And so um, particularly for those really rare diseases, just leveraging the groups <clears throat> to recruit patients is also very helpful. Right. I think there was one more question in the back. I'm at the same place as you, Tom, so. <laughs> but I know we have lots of new leadership in research through our Carillion. We have great leadership at VTCRI and SOM and tech, and integrating together has been a challenge, but we're doing it, and there, we're, we're examples of, of such a thing. But even the, the culture, right? Many um, cities, areas, hospitals are not, uh, don't have the culture of a research uh, atmosphere, and we're learning to change that. We were talking last night that we got our <coughs> first uh, study on our Facebook page for Carilli, and I'm like, yes, it took us a long time to get something like that on social media. But even integrating, and you know that, it's, it's difficult between departments. I, and I know that's what we're all breaking down, right? Our silos are breaking down and we're working together, but it's still difficult. So family medicine sees a lot of the patients we do, um, internal medicine, pediatrics. It's, it's still hard to do that together and I'm not sure where there are good models. Are there good models of that at UVA? Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, I think there are more and more diseases that are approached from a, a, a multidisciplinary perspective and certainly there are a lot of funding organizations that recognize that you can get so much more done with a team than with a single investigator. So there, there'll be requests for proposals, you know, across departments or across uh, institutes. Uh, and I think that's the type of thing that will really fuel progress because uh, most of the things that we deal with now, nobody, no single person could, you know, could make much progress. I think, I think we're going to have to end there to stay on time. I want to give one more round of applause to our speakers, all six of our speakers.